Well, we're concluding, coming down to the end of uh, Revelation, our study in the book of the Revelation. I like chapter 19 because we're getting ready to turn the corner, but we do need to review 18, uh, 17 and 18 in order to give the final part uh, in preparation for our study for the remainder of the book. Of course, the book of the Revelation, for many, it's a frightening book. And that fear does not come from God because he loves the book. And he said there is a blessing for those who read it and hear it, the book, the book of the Revelation. That's one of the reasons why I share it with you. And uh, there are seasons in my study that I wonder, Lord, why do you want us to know all this? What does that matter for uh, our future? I mean, it's good to know some of these things. And there's so many other things are really, I have to just... Uh, wonder what really is going to happen because we do not know what stage of history we're in we believe we're in the last days i feel like that we could we we don't have to even look for any more signs just start listening for the shout you know he's going to come and i'm excited about that at the same time uh, i can get a little bogged down uh, in all the details of the book of revelation except there is a promise of blessing and I want you to have the promise. I quite frankly want to have the promise myself. So I've spent many, many hours in this book learning much and enjoying what I've learned. What we do know in the book of the Revelation is that it's given to us in three major segments. What was, uh, what is, and what things are going to happen in the future. The Bible tells that in Revelation chapter 1. Chapter 1 tells us what was, and that refers to the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. His power, his, uh, his program for the ages is given to us. The person of Jesus, the power of Jesus, and his program for the ages is laid out in chapter 1. Chapter 2 and 3, we see the story and what is, is the church age. It is God's people who have been called out by salvation and who are serving the Lord in this time while we wait for Jesus to come back. We see there's seven different kinds of churches beginning with the loveless church of Ephesus and going on down to the lowly church who was persecuted there in Smyrna. And then the other churches, the two in the middle, the loose church and the lawless church, the church of Thyatira that is, is a church that could go through the tribulation period if the Lord were to come back. Churches like that. Sardis, having a name that is alive, but really they're dead on the inside. The faithful church uh, and the loyal church of, um, of uh, Philadelphia and then the following church, is the last church in the church of Laodicea, the lukewarm church. If you traveled the world and went to churches, you could probably category every church in one of those particular categories. Uh, if I, I want to pick which one I want to be a part of, I want to be a part of the Philadelphia church. The church is lowly. It does not seem to receive any condemnation, only commendation and a desire that comes from the Savior to persevere and keep on winning the lost and going forward for the Lord. I don't want to be a lukewarm church. It's hot, neither hot nor cold, just maintaining apathy in a world, thinking we have it, we're all that and we're not. Thinking we're clothed and we're naked, thinking we can see and we're blind, thinking we're strong and we're weak, thinking we're rich and we're poor. I don't want to be a part of that, but that shares with us the middle. And then chapter 4 and verse number 1, we hear the words of the Lord Jesus saying to John, come up hither. I believe that is a type of the rapture. Interesting so from chapter 4 and verse number 1 until chapter 19 and verse number 4, the church is no longer mentioned in the rest of the book of the Revelation in that, in that parenthesis. It's mentioned plenty of times before that, and it will be mentioned again at the end, chapters 19, 12, or 4 through the end of the book, you'll mention the church again, but not during that time, because that parenthesis is what I believe to be seven years of tribulation. Seven years when God begins to strategically bring back to this world, back into His control preparing this world as we know it and the systems of this world to uh, be controlled by the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't think we could even factor and fathom in our mind 
how much this world system is diametrically opposed to Jesus. But after seven years of God unleashing, number one, seven uh, sealed judgments on this world, and then seven trumpet judgments, and then seven vile judgments. Now, in that time, in judgment, God remembers mercy. He sends two prophets to come. Two Old Testament prophets, we believe. It could be uh, Moses and Elijah. It could be Elijah and Enoch. There's been some, some folks who debate that. I really don't care who it is. I'm just excited that God told us uh, that there will be two. They will preach the gospel. At three years and a half, they will be killed and left for dead in the middle of the street. And they'll lay there for three days and people will give out gifts like it's Christmas. Yay, these people who are indestructible are finally gone. And they'll give out a party. They'll, they'll, they'll be able to see that and let everybody know that these people are dead. Then they'll get the call from God to come up hither too and they'll be resurrected. But in that process of time, it looks like that they will influence 144,000 Jewish virgin men who will go all over the world and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and no doubt turn many to the Lord in the regions beyond and around the world and they'll be saved. Some people believe there'll be as many people saved in the tribulation period than have been in all history. I don't know that I would acquiesce to that. That's just somebody's opinion. But there will be numbers of people coming to know the Lord as their Savior. But now God is doing a stranglehold and, and, uh, and this world is going to do what they do in some fights, they tap out. They're going to say enough is enough. But, they, but those who are against God continue to curse Him until the very end. We saw that in chapter 16 when we've last studied the Scriptures. And, and even though they were scorched with the sun and though they were, they, were, they were so tormented with sores, they still cursed the name of God vilely and blaspheme the name of the Most High. But in chapter 17 and 18, I'm just going to real quickly skim over these, these chapters. There's a lot of information here, and it revolves a lot around Babylon. Over 300 times in your Bible, the word Babylon is used. It's oftentimes used in contrast to the city of our great God, Jerusalem. Babylon is the place where the first world dictator, Nimrod, set up his rule and reign there at the Tower of Babel. And it is probably where the last human being or the last uh, organized leadership will take place is also in Babylon. Now, I don't know. There's lots of arguments about that. Of course, Baghdad, Iraq, is the area where Babylon is. He was rebuilding a city. I don't know how many miles. Somebody could tell me. I think 50 miles from Baghdad. Some of their brother George Zaris and others might be familiar with that. Some believe that is aware that the, that the Antichrist and, the, and, the, and his, uh, his leadership will be based out of that area. I don't know that for sure. But also we see there is a whore, the Bible calls her. There is a religious system that also has surfaced throughout history, and it seems to be the Roman Catholic Church. It seems to be that is what we, when we read the Bible, it's very hard not to say that it looks like that has something to do with it. Let's look and see what the Bible says and then make applications, and this is not to be unkind, but you do see some amazing parallels. Verse 1 of chapter 17. And there came one of the seven angels with the seven vials, and he talked with me, saying unto me, once again, talking to John, come up hither. John's on the Isle of Patmos when he receives this revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ. And I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. And of course, the, we'll learn later that that, that this particular waters, this, this uh, sin of many waters means he's all over the place, all over the world, the nations of the world that is he's talking about. It's not, uh, this, this great whore that has penetrated almost every form of society as we know it. Verse number two. With whom the, chi the kings of the earth have committed fornication, political leaders have played and, uh, and enjoyed uh, relationship with her and the inhabitants of the earth have made drunk with the wine of her fornication 
Religion is man's attempt to cover himself before God. And, 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 and of course, the phylacteries, the rituals, the things of that nature, many people have adopted or walked in to this particular uh, prey of, of, this, of this whore that God calls here. Verse number three. And he carried me away in the spirit of the wilderness, in the wilderness, and I saw a woman set upon a, a set upon scarlet colored beast. And the beast here, I think, is representation of the, the leadership of the day or this system, governing system, full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And we could go over to Daniel and see some of these. Uh, same prophetic things seen by Daniel hundreds of years before. Now John is sharing with us what Jesus is showing him. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of the abominations and filthiness of her fornication. It's interesting there, these colors, these phylacteries, and even the golden cup that is held by, by oftentimes the leadership of that. You see the jewelry, the cup, the colors, all of those play right into uh, this system that we talk about this evening. Number five. And upon the forehead was the name written, Mystery Babylon, the great mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of saints. And with the blood of martyrs of Jesus, and when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration, or another word for admiration was just amazement, that the one who would, per would persecute so badly the true saints of Jesus Christ would be a religious system. And it doesn't take hard. You can start talking to missionaries in, in places where Roman Catholicism is extremely intense and you'll see that they've been stoned they have been hired they've been tried to, to hurt and and cause all kinds of things someone said to me one day that that um, that uh, someone who studied this I don't know which one is it one pope on one afternoon killed more Christians and the Reformation killed altogether can't imagine that but that was someone's statement nonetheless she was drunken with the blood of martyrs of Christians who through the ages have served the Lord and tried to be faithful. People like Martin Luther who came out of Roman Catholicism and nailed his thesis there, was persecuted much of his rest of his life. Many folks have been hurt. Baptists and other folks who have stand, stood for the things of God have been persecuted because of their belief and because of the refusal to walk the, uh, the line that is laid out there. Verse number 8. And the beast that thou sawest, uh, it uh, was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not in the book of life from the foundation of the world. And they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. There's a little bit of double talk there, it seems to be. But basically what I feel like it says is this Antichrist is someone who is going to appear to die and be brought back to life. And of course, that is one to sway, uh, and he's going to imitate Jesus in that way, but it appeared to die and be heard and brought back. We see this several places, also in the book of the Revelation in chapter 13. But for we're not going through specific things, but I wanted to share with you a little bit the uh, thumbnail sketch of this particular chapter. Look at verse number 9. Read the first st sentence with me, would you please? And here... So now he says, here's the mind that hath wisdom. Now try to figure it out, if you will. He said, if you have wisdom, then think about this together. The seven heads are the seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Of course, the word mountains can also be translated hills. And what is a city built on seven hills? Rome. So it says that this is a place. And so you see a lot of similarities here. But also mountains also translate, or not translate, but also is uh, illustrated in Daniel chapter 4 is, is governments. And there are seven kings, that five are fallen, one is and one is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue in a, a short space. 
And the beast that was, or the system, the government, that last government that is, I believe is more of a system than a person, and is not, even he is the eighth and is the seventh that goeth into perdition. So a little bit of a little bit of challenging thoughts here, but basically I'm saying if you look at uh, the world history as we have known it, there have been major empires. Uh, Egypt being one of those empires. And then uh, Assyria, and then Babylon, and then Persia, and then Greece, and then Rome. And uh, to the, to so much of our government is established in the Roman rule, Roman uh, sta standard of living. But you see these major empires throughout history from Egypt to Assyria to Babylon. And then, of course, if you read the book of Daniel, you'll see that there are four kings that Daniel served under. And while Babylon started out, well, then Persia, and then Greece, Alexander the Great, and then, of course, Rome. And then Jesus lived during the Roman Empire, as it will. And now there seems to be another one. He said the six already are, but there's one yet to come. And we believe that to be the Antichrist and his rule at the end. Once again, we're reading the last few pages of the book of the Revelation and even closer to chapter 19 where it concludes the seven years of tribulation. We're coming down to the very end, approaching the battle of Armageddon. And here we find... He's describing this particular scenario. Verse number 13. And these have all one, have one mind. Let's pick up verse number 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as of yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. I don't think that's probably a 60-minute hour, but basically it looks like to me that, there, that this that this uh, world leader, the Antichrist, will have ten kingdoms and ten world rulers there who do not have their powers of yet. Maybe we don't know who they are. Maybe they're going to surface during the tribulation period. But these ten rulers will have their day in the sun. They'll have their hour in the spotlight. And they will be serving the beast. They'll follow him. Uh, and the kings with one hour, they'll have their hour, their time with the beast. Verse 13. These have one mind and shall have their power and strength into the beast. These shall make war with the lamb. And the lamb shall do what? Overcome them. And he is the Lord of lords and the king of kings. And they that are with him are, here he refers to people that are with Jesus in heaven at the time. What are they? Called and? And so he says here that this Antichrist, this kingdom with his, with his cronies, his ten kings that have their day in the sun, they make war with the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Tell you what, I understand why people can be against Jesus and not like Jesus, but I think it's a real dumb thing to fight him. <laughs> and this is what they're going to do. They're going to fight and make war with the Lamb, and then the Lamb is going to overcome him. And he says he's going to do that with people who are called and chosen and faithful. Now, let me just ask you a question here. Where is Jesus during the time of the tribulation period? He's with us, is he not? Celebrating the marriage of the Lamb. He's celebrating there with his, with his church that has been taken out in Revelation chapter 4. And when he comes back from heaven, now he comes back for a fight, but he's going to come back with his saints. Those who have been called, chosen, and are faithful with him. I think it's another proof text that Jesus is coming before the tribulation period. And not in the middle or later on. Look, if you would please, at verse number 15. And he saith unto me, the waters which thou hast has saw us where the horse sitting are the peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest of the beast shall make haste, shall, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. And God, for God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is, is, is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. 
And of course now we find there is a, a revolt against this whore, this, this religious system that is, has been in partnership with the kings of the earth. Now they turn on the whore. They turn on her. Look, if you would please, in verse number, chapter 18 and verse number 1. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven and having a great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and hold every one foul spirit in the cage of every one unclean and hateful bird. And all the nations have drunk the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth that have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, and ye, sh in, in, uh, excuse me, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. And her sins have reached into heaven, and God hath. Uh, remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as, it re as she rewarded you double unto double her double according to her works in the, in the cup which she hath filled, uh, filled, filled to her double. How much she hath glorified herself and lived in, lush, in, de in deliciously and uh, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she hath in her heart, I said as a queen, I am no widow, and, uh, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall utterly burn with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. Here we find, I think, the, uh, the tumbling over of a religious system that God's going to deal with very severely here, and notice there, I, I just think it's kind of interesting. Uh, even I heard Brother Abdel pray this evening, Lord, don't let the birds that, that take the, the seed of the Word of God and take it away. In Matthew, God talks about that. And here we find that, that it seems to be, you know, it's amazing to me that whenever I have witnessed to people, share the gospel with them, within days, their family members from another religion come and they want to now say, well, no, 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 you need to go to our church now. The, the Jehovah Witness or someone else comes in or some guy at work all of a sudden gets excited about their new spiritual uh, change and they want to come in and begin to do that. And oftentimes those are form of demonic activity. They come and try to take away the seed. Here he refers to that here in this passage of Scripture as that. And I just want to say quickly, I need to, I need, I'm not going to spend the entire time on chapter 18, but we do see that God deals with this. This is all about the religious, the religious system. But we do know this, that it becomes a political issue, and you can see that in verse number 9. Notice this, and the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and live deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. Standing afar off in the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, the great city of Babylon, the mighty city, for one that hour is, is, is thy judgment come. It becomes a political issue. It also becomes a very commercial issue. You'll see that in the next verse that, that the merchants of the earth who are intermarried with this religious system, they're hurt by that. And God gives 28 commodities or cargoes that are in the so as not to make it, I think, figuratively. He see, you'll read the next few verses, you'll see the 28 cargoes or commodities that are traded by merchants that are hurt by this judgment that God brings. And then even the ship and the commerce that we have is, is approached later on in verse number 17. But I want you to notice, if we can, in closing tonight, verse 20. And I want you to notice this word. What's the first word in verse 20? Rejoice. The first time you'll see this from, from the time that God begins to pour out His judgment, you'll see this is the first time that He asks God's people to rejoice. Notice what it says there, rejoice over her. Thou heaven and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. Then it begins to talk about the future of Babylon and this system there is a total and final devastation and destruction. But then in verse chapter 19 where Brother 
Brother Colston Redison reading, look at verse number one. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah. By the way, do you know how to say hallelujah in Korean? Hallelujah. You know how to say it in Zimbabwe and in, in uh, Swahili? Hallelujah. <laughs> it's one of the words that's the same in every language. I kind of like that one. When, when it comes time to talk about that from every language, tongue, or tribe, hallelujah is the same in every single language of the, of the world there. The people will say, hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power are unto the Lord our God. I love that because it means God wins. <laughs> God lets us know kind of what's going on. He's going to make the next few verses at the end of this situation as bitter and as uncomfortable as it may be to study and see all that is going on. I'm reminded of a couple things. I am so glad I'm not going to be there when it happens. Number two, I do not want other friends of mine to go through that. I don't want to go through tribulation. I don't want them to go through uh, the great white throne judgment. I want to be a soul winner. I want to be conscious about the lost. I also want to be very praiseful about our God. He is in the heavens. He's done whatsoever he wants. And even in judgment, he remembers mercy. You know, it's amazing to me that God is going to save people during the tribulation period. Even when he brings judgment, he offers mercy to people. He offers a forgiveness that's available. What a great God that we have. And you say, well, I'm not used to praising you. You might want to get used to it. We're going to be there when it happens. And now everybody from every tongue and tribe and kindred of the world is going to sing hallelujah to the Lord our God. He is the Lord God in heaven. I'm glad I'm called. I'm glad I'm chosen. I'm glad I can be faithful. And I want to be in all three of those categories. Let's pray together. Let's stand to our feet. If you're here this evening, I know we have some that need to be baptized. With their heads bowed and their eyes closed, you're welcome to come right away. Prepare for baptism. There may be others who would say, Pastor, this bothers me because I know I'm not saved. Why don't you come and let someone take the Bible and show you how to be saved? Maybe you're here and you're saved, but you're not a soul-conscious person. You don't give out tracts because you don't keep tracts. Not giving them out and you're not concerned for the lost. Let God speak to your heart. May I say, when's the last time you praised the Lord? You gave Him glory and honor. It should be something we do. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. May God help us to do that. Our Father, work in our hearts and use the invitation for your honor and your glory. Thank you that you give us insight on what's going to happen. And it's very dangerous, very terrible. At the same time, I pray that we would be not just saying, "Woo, boy, am I glad I'm not going to be there, but help us to be soul conscious so others will not be there either. And we can be a part of bringing those who are called and chosen and faithful to you one day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.